warm is ready. Don't worry, everyone. We sometimes battle to get the right buttons. There are a lot of buttons to push out here, and... Uh... Oops, we got a bit of a problem going to Dusty Crossing. That's okay. We seem to have lost the picture for Dusty Crossing, which is not too much of a problem. These things happen from time to time out here, especially after a day like this where we've had a lot of rain. Let's go have a look at what the rapids here at Main North are looking like and see if the water level has raised or has subdued a little bit. I don't know, those waves look just as big as they did this morning, to be honest with you. Massive, hey? Now, apparently, this is, this is all supposed to be underwater at the moment. These rocks where we are now are supposed to be covered in water. Shows you how big these rapids can get. Um, we seem to have found Dusty again, so why don't we go across to Dusty? There is a, is a hippo. Now, I know that a big bull hippo like that weighs in and around the 2,000 pounds. And I don't know about you, but that crocodile looks easily about half the size of that hippo. Have a look at this guy. Douglas, you'd like to know if the crocodiles gorge themselves like the lions do when they're eating. Um, it's called bolting of food, and it's quite common amongst uh, predators, even crocodiles, where the chance that the food is taken away from you by either numerous small animals or bigger crocodiles or bigger lions is a possibility. And I would say absolutely. Just looking at some of the feeding frenzies that I've seen of the crocodiles here, there seems to be that it's all relaxed up until one starts eating, and then it's like there's no tomorrow. And these crocodiles absolutely then start to just rip off chunks and swallow down as much as they can, as quickly as they can. This guy looks full, doesn't he? I mean, I would imagine that a crocodile trying to flatten himself out to get the most sun possible would be slightly skinnier, but that belly just looks like it has got a ton of meat in it, doesn't it? Ace Gaming, I think, is, is your name. You just wanted to know if, if this crocodile is sunning itself. It is absolutely Ace Gaming. Um, they come out of the water, they're cold-blooded, they come out of the water now at this time of the year to make sure that their bodies are in the optimal temperature range to metabolize meat as fast as they can. The reason for that is that there's the super abundance of food at the moment. And crocodiles need to work through that food in their tummies, turn it into fat, because once the migration leaves here in a couple of weeks' time, it's, it's going to be over for these crocodiles for a while. There will, of course, be a meal every now and again, but the super abundance of food that they are used to now goes away. And then they'll be living. Their massive bulk will be supported by the fat that they manage to pack on now. A lot of animals have the strategy. It's not just, uh, it's not just crocodiles. But this, these guys are really enjoying things right now. now. Yesterday I asked the question, what is this fat roll on the neck of a crocodile? You see it when they're gulping down prey. I don't know, is it a chamber that allows them to swallow massive pieces of meat? Is it something that helps them produce a sound? What is that? Creative about this stuff. It's very difficult to think about it on the fly. I'm the worst culprit of the cliché out here, however, so I'm going to work on it myself. Uh, the first cliché that I keep perpetuating is that every time you come back to me, I say, hello, everybody, which, of course, is now getting a little tired. Now, that is my little rant on the uh, state of affairs here at Safari Line. Let us just enjoy the soft light that is falling on this giraffe. It looks very magnificent indeed. And it is in amongst some zebra. And there are lions not too far from here. But I think even Taylor's lions, poorly visible as they were, are better visible than the ones we have here. These chaps seem to be almost completely hidden in the grass. And I wonder which ones they are. Quite possibly of the sausage tree pride. Or maybe the olololos. I'm really not sure at all. But this might be a good place to come back to as the sun starts to set. Because, of course, they may go on the hunt then. But we're in a non-off-roading zone. And we're not going to spend too long here. We'll head back along the river and see what else is happening. Isn't that nice? Sinak, you're wondering what species of giraffe this is. Sinak, this giraffe species is known as the Maasai giraffe, and that is a cow, which is a female. You can tell that by, first of all, the fact that her horns are hourglass-shaped, with hair on the top of them. And, well, if you sometimes that's a little difficult to see. The easiest thing to do, of course, is to slip between the back legs. And if there ain't nothing there, then you know it's a female. And what's interesting, Sinak, you say, I think you said it, she looks so big. Not really. I think they're smaller than the southern giraffe, in fact. Uh, very slightly smaller. And although I've called them a different species, they're actually the same species. They're just a different subspecies. And it's so interesting to think that just about every single animal we have up here is a different subspecies from the ones down at Tumor. Heather, you're wondering about what the most closely related species to a giraffe is. The most closely related species to a giraffe is something called an okapi, and it is found in the Central African rainforest, and uh, I will find you a picture of the okapi, and simply because it's a remarkable looking creature, and I'd love to see one. I haven't ever seen one, but I would very much like to see one. I'm just going to try and find So, Mr. P, you were wondering, um, 
he was 13 months when he was left alone by Karula, or unfortunately was basically orphaned by Karula, and, and is this normal time for leopards to be left on their own? And it must have been no, so, well, no is not really the right answer. It, it's possible, so most of the time leopards will generally stay with their, their mothers for a little bit longer than that, normally up towards two years, so they say generally between 14 months and two years, so I suppose it's not too far away. But given that she was, you know, still looking after them so much, I think that process was still going to take quite a while, so I would have imagined that it would have been closer towards the two-year side than the one-year side that happened to him. They there has been leopards that have left their cubs at 10 months and, and have those cubs have survived, but generally the, the mothers will keep them for a while, and, and, and particularly males like Osana, they tend to latch onto their mothers for a lot longer than the females. You'll often find male um, offspring staying with the females for longer periods. I, I saw when I was at St. Kita, we had ravens caught female, and at one point she had um, a, a male called Shinzele, and then she had two younger males, and the two younger males were already a year old, and Shinzele, who was now almost three and a half, was still actually with his mother, and she was looking after both the older male and the two younger ones, which is completely unusual and not something you would hear of, and the four of them used to walk around together. It was really quite strange to see, but the males tend to try and latch onto mom for longer. It's easier. Remember that they, they as soon as they go off on their own, they then deem to be a threat by other males and are pushed around and have to be nomadic, so if they can stay with mom as much as possible and be fed and grow and get bigger, it's only going to mean better things for them as they become older and try and then start moving up in the world and get a territory of their own. So it was probably a bit early for Hosanna, but as you can see, he's doing just fine. He's really kind of figuring it out. He's, he's managing to pull down quite large antelope in the form of these impalas that you see here, and his condition is fantastic. And, you know, we're, we're six months down the line now, and he has in no way looked as though he struggled from day one. So he just goes to show that leopards are, are very resourceful creatures, and they'll survive off anything if they have to. We know that he used to hunt monitor lizards and terrapins that had started, and he's graduated now into these antelopes. And now that he's can killing antelopes like this, you're going to find a situation that he really should be well set to carry on with life and, and should be able to find his way. His, his biggest challenge now, obviously, is to find a territory and, and to not only find a territory, but to be able to dominate it and keep others at bay. And that's going to be, you know, very difficult considering the density of male leopards within this northern section. He's been aided somewhat by the current sort of bad luck that we've had with the Sabi Sands leopards of late, where there's been a number of males to the south of him that have succumbed for various reasons, and that's almost opened up an opportunity for Hosanna in a way. We know that his older brother, in the form of Konyuma, has moved into some of those areas where male leopards have been killed by lions or have, are no longer alive, and he's forged a territory of his own, so I wonder if Hosanna's going to follow a similar pattern and shift in that southward direction towards those areas. It's going to be interesting to see. I think Tengana's still fit and healthy enough that Hosanna doubt is going to get this particular section just yet, but you never know. Hosanna, I mean, Tengana is getting older, as is Mbula, and both of those males theoretically are, are around the 12 year mark, and that's quite old for a male leopard, and so you'll find that they'll reach, you know, 12, 13, 14 and maybe disappear, so it might actually be perfect timing for Hosanna to actually move into this area and take over. Yeah, well, let's see if this hippo is feeling a little bit insecure quite often. Whoopsie. Sorry, everyone. It happens from time to time with these cameras as they lose and get signal again, depending on the weather conditions around us. No, I think that hippo was just busy escorting this uh, wildebeest out of uh, out of its pool, and there it carries on floating by. It is amazing. It really is. Now, if we go to, I would assume, if we go to um, Main South, we will get a view of this carcass coming down, and at some point, I think what's going to happen is we are going to see that uh, I'm hoping at least anyway that the uh, that this carcass elicits some attention from a crocodile so let's just see it is on the, this bank it's going to come around this corner oh, hold on I'm on the wrong camera <laughs> excuse me everybody this is the first time in my life I've had to operate a camera and think about what I'm saying and you know it's all a bit much for my tired little brain so I think that carcass is going to come around this corner now in the next couple of minutes, seconds at least anyway. While we're waiting for it to come around the corner, why don't we go and have a look at Dusty Crossing, which has got also its own resident carcass. And there's a hippo that's busy looking at a crocodile. I don't know what this hippo is busy doing, but it's looking at this crocodile as if to say, you in my staircase into my swimming pool. Like, what are you doing over there? That bloated, rotting carcass, carcass is also another wildebeest. Love my Charlie face. You want to know if crocodiles attack hippos? I, I, I've seen crocodiles eating dead hippos. Um, a lot in actual fact but you never actually see crocodiles attacking hippo you also don't see mother crocodiles being particular i mean mother hippo being particularly um aggressive or particularly worrying worried about uh about uh, baby hippos although i would imagine that a baby hippo for a massive crocodile would absolutely become food at some point now we've got a choice we can watch what this hippo is going to do to this carcass or we can follow the carcass that has now come into shot at um, main south Let's see what, uh, what this hippo does to this carcass. Now, I've, I've seen that hippo quite often will lick a carcass. I have no idea why just yet. And let's see if it's the same. Let's see if it's the same. All my, all my literature that I have available talking about hippo that 
feed on meat. Never says anything about this licking that happens. And I've watched hippo lick carcasses a lot more than I've watched them feed on carcasses. Kathy, you've asked what does it smell like at the river? Can we go to Main South while I answer this? Um, we got a crocodile edging towards this uh, wildebeest carcass. Uh, Kathy, it stinks like you cannot believe. It smells like a month old dead corpse. And the whole river system smells. You can see that this crocodile angle is angling in. Let's see what it does when it does get close. No, it's decided it's had enough. Dead meat is not what it wants. Massive crocodile. And once they start placing their scent marks all over the trees and bushes where they know the males frequent, that will of course let the males know that there's a female in season. And then I'm guessing they're going to be trying to seek her out more than them, but she's definitely also going to kind of play ball to a degree. But once they get the sense of a female, they are definitely going to be doing their very, very best, especially when she's in season, or only really when she's in season, to try and track her down. I've never been fortunate enough to see an event like that happen in my life, Lynn, so hopefully we'll be lucky enough to share that together. The act of cheetah mating is something that's fairly uncommon to document. There's not many videos or photographs I've seen of cheetahs mating. And it can be quite interesting, it can be quite different to seeing leopard and lion mate, because with leopard and lion there's usually only one male. However, with cheetahs, even though there may be dominance within the coalition, what I've been told and what I've seen in a few videos is that certain males will actually be able to slide their way in between their companion and hop on top, so they almost take turns in mating with the females. Who knows what would happen if all five of the musketeers got involved, it would be a serious pylon and lots of chopping and changing. She certainly does seem to be looking for something now, going from bush to bush and smelling. So I wonder if she is maybe looking for the males or there's something else she may be seeking out. Hello Tony, you'd like to know if males and coalitions would weigh more than individuals or, or, or smaller coalitions? I guess slightly, but I mean there's a slight possibility, yes, that because there's a coalition, or well, a coalition comes with a lot of power and good hunting skill. It seems to be raging at the moment. Maybe it's just because it's going over that very rocky section sort of creating rapids. And this roller is going to be very excited in a minute because it's just starting to drizzle. And all the insect life is going to come out in abundance and then it'll be sweeping around, filling its belly. Although I think after last night with all the alates and the variety of insects that were flying about, it can't be too full. I mean, it can't be too hungry, sorry. I definitely think... Hey, off it goes. Beautiful. I think it's actually going to try and catch an insect too. Did you get one? Oh, get it! The, oh look at them, they are, they are hysterical. This is another animal that you have to spend time with. And for those of you that live in South Africa, uh, they're all over the, the country. You see them a lot in Cape Town, they're in the parks. They are really, really, really funny to watch. They chase each other around. And my favorite is to watch them pecking through and digging through uh, dung middens. But again, they will also be very, very happy about the rain bringing all the insects out and about. They eat a bit of everything. I think what they're going for now, the fact that they're chasing after and then beaks to the ground, must mean that there's some flying insects, or even some grasshoppers, just moving about. These are the helmeted guinea fowls. I still haven't seen... Ooh, that one just took off! <laughs> now they're hysterical. <laughs> I still haven't seen the vulturine guinea fowls in the wild, which I'd like to. Look at them go. Now, take care, you're wondering if the soil is high in clay content. Content. Um, this looks more... Like, it's probably got a bit more iron in it than anything. Uh, it's very rocky here. Uh, as soon as you move towards below the pretty much below the escarpment there's quite a bit of clay which is not great obviously for driving on roads all those black cotton soils um so no and you know that i haven't seen another miss i miss the sandy areas in in juma well you know i miss marula trees a lot i mean these soils martin martin is sitting in fc who is also the birthday boy so for those of you who haven't heard of martin martin has just recently joined the wild earth team as a technical genius and um, so alex is teaching him the ropes now a russian genius and uh, it's also his birthday happy 24th birthday martin whoop, whoop. Uh, and you were wondering can guinea fowl fly they can they can indeed fly they don't fly particularly well though they will roost in trees at night so that's a safe spot uh, for them to sleep well sometimes not always and they fly like a chicken, if I had to describe it. So when, when they need to, but they spend most of their time on the ground. They don't feed on the wings, so they don't feed while they're in flight. They have to forage on the floor. Well, who knows? Maybe they pick something out while they're in the tree, but I doubt it because it's normally nighttime. Very busy. Must be answer to Maybe there's some seeds on the ground too. This is my mom's favorite bird. I think I've told most of you that. She loves it, and I'll never forget as a kid. I'm just reminded of this when I see her again. 
she used to have a guinea fowl t-shirt literally it was just a t-shirt that was black with white spots on <laughs> and she would wear that every single time we'd go to kruger and, and it's just a fond memory when i see these birds it reminds me of my mom in that shirt oh they are so cool it's a pity they're not having any sort of domestics amongst one another because it's hysterical <laughs> <laughs> it's an abiding fascination for me uh, uh the way we say that oh there's a pig male line there there's a beautiful female lion. We never ever say, there's an ugly lioness and there's a small male lion. Never happens. Same with leopards. I've never heard anybody say there's a small male leopard. Now, there was something, somebody asked me the other day about a browse lion. And I don't know if you remember that. And I don't even know what the, I don't even remember what the context was. But Craig, if we can go across to that tree that has the vulture in it. You see that there? You can see that tree's got a very clear browse line. It's been chopped at an exact level. And I think that's almost certainly by giraffe. That have picked the leaves up to that level and they're unable to pick any more than that. And I don't know what species it is. It looks like it could be related to an apple leaf of some sort, but I'm not sure. And none of the other tree species around here, oh, well, there are one or two. In fact, if you follow the line of that woodland, you can see one or two species that have definitely been sort of shaped by the attentions of the giraffe, which I think is quite interesting, because many do not have such a lion, so some are obviously not very palatable. The lion has done as suspected, as I suspected he would. He's gone back down to sleep. There are apparently two lionesses and two males in there. Obviously the lionesses are beautiful and both the males are big. And then underneath that very nice green tree there, can you see the green tree? Well, they're all green really. It is the, it's the green earth tree to the right of that, if you would be so kind, Craig, no laugh at me. There we are. <laughs> there. Underneath that we've got some marabu stalks, and the marabu stalks are almost certainly feeding on the remnants of a wildebeesten that either died of natural causes or was most possibly taken down by this pride of lions. Now, in the same way that we link across to the tallest animal in Africa, mysteriously, let's go across to Scott for mysteriously the fastest animal in the world. Not right now, no. But yes, possibly later, we will see the fastest mammal on the planet doing its thing. And wouldn't that be nice? They're not looking too lively now, but about 15 minutes ago, they were tossing and turning, a bit of yawning. So I think they just hit the snooze button and are having one little s session before they get up and go. Let's hope that's the case. It would be lovely to get them going while we've still got some golden afternoon sunlight. Having said that, though, it's looking like a good evening for a sunset. There's not too many clouds out to the west. But, you know, I find it much more silent here in the grasslands than I do in the woodlands of South Africa. Uh, Mr. Ross popped her head up, and that tells me that perhaps she has spotted a lion. Now, we're going to sit with Hosanna, but let's, while we do that, go across to Scott in the Mara, who's gazing upon not an impala, but a little Thompson's gazelle. Is this not an absolutely beautiful scene with all these little white flowers that have only emerged in the last week or so? Along with the Thompson's gazelle, as always, wagging their little tails. The very dark backdrop, and that bark, d bark backdrop, that dark backdrop, is a little bit of a concern. I've also heard some thunder rumbling off to the north, and we may have another afternoon deluge. And after last night's antics, I'm not sure if I'm ready to, ready to get soaking wet again. It was a fairly cold and long drive home, but certainly worth it. Beautiful. So, you obviously realise we've moved away from the cheetah. We've just taken a short drive in the hope that we could find you some beautiful, beautiful scenes like this while the cheetah are sleeping, but we will be heading back there shortly just to make sure we don't miss out on any action. Martin, great to have you with us. You would like to know how do we get the picture from our vehicle straight to you guys live? And that is an incredibly good question for which I do not have the appropriate know-how, expertise, or knowledge as to how exactly it works. But I think it basically goes straight from the vehicle up to a satellite and then I think from a satellite it goes to some funky machine in London and then from London I think it gets shot out to all around the planet. Um, I think that is how it works. There's a whole bunch of fancy machines called encoders and modulators and a few that I don't even know the names of that are fairly intricately wired together in order to get this worked out. I'll 
tech wizard and camp Jared is having a little bit of a giggle in the final control room, I, th I think, as to my explanation as to how it works. Um, but what I can tell you, Martin, is that our team of tech guys are serious pioneers within this industry. They are ahead of the game and often have to build their parts and kind of interconnect strange things that aren't supposed to be connected in theory. So it certainly is a lot of fun watching from a distance as they tweak and jiggle cables to make the feed and picture work. Even building the camera rigs is something that the cameramen and the tech guys also do on sites. We've got a over and under double decker camera combo with a infrared camera on the bottom and a thermal camera on the top. Sadly, that thermal camera is taking a few days off. Roshni, I'm very happy that you are enjoying this beautiful, beautiful view. Isn't it just something else? The vistas, along with the animals that are dotted through them in the Masai Mara, certainly make for some wonderful, wonderful views. A very calm and peaceful scene that came in there. How interesting was that? Why did it just let the carcass go? Obviously it came within sensing of it, saw that it wasn't alive, and then, you know, that discounts everything I've been told about a crocodile. A crocodile will choose rotting soft meat over fresh meat, given the choice and given the fact that they are, given the fact that they, uh, that they are full. Shows you. Don't trust what you read. Trust what you see. Let's go back to Dusty Crossing, if you don't mind. That, uh, that hippo is still busy licking this carcass. I just don't know what's going on here. How beautiful is that pink tinge to a hippo's skin? It's not every day that we get to see that. Now, that is created by a secretion on the hippo's skin called hipposudoric acid and nor hipposudoric acid, which are two sort of sticky... I suppose the closest that we could get to is, is, is sweat that the hippo produces. Oh, look at that. Wow. Now, that looked like a proper yawn. It didn't look like he was trying to intimidate a dead wildebeest. That just looked like a decent yawn. Now, that pinkish tinge comes from the fact that, uh, that this, this secretion dries to this sticky pink uh, and sometimes orangey-hued um, residue on the skin of the hippo. The, one, of the, the, one of the compounds is UV absorbent. The other one is a very good antibacterial. Uh, compound and it just sort of protects the hippo's skin. Hippo being closely related to whales and to another yawn. What's going on there? Um, being closely related to manatees and hippo uh, uh, and uh, and whales don't have any sebaceous glands on their skin whatsoever. And so this is the only gland that these hippo have managed to evolve. Look at that. Eyes closed. This is mad. David, you've made a comment there about this hippo perhaps smelling the, uh, the, the grass inside of the wildebeest's stomach. Um, I don't think it's too far out of the realms of possibility there, although I've watched them do this to fresh carcasses as well. And that wildebeest looks rank. This hippo is so tired, tears are streaming out of his eyes. And he's just washing his mouth out. I'd also wash my mouth out after licking such a putrid carcass. James, you want to know if the vultures will come and feed on a carcass like this? James, uh, you do see the, 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 the vultures descending on carcasses, especially those ones that are stuck um, on rocks. Not so much that are bobbing around under their own buoyancy, like this one, but definitely ones that are stuck on rocks. They will descend and feed on them in the river. In fact, a couple of days ago, probably about a week ago, we watched a vulture fall off of a carcass, flap around in the water, almost get eaten by a crocodile before managing to make it to the bank uh, with, you know, inches to spare. This hippo is so disgusted in himself, he's got his whole head under the water at the moment. <laughs> ah, that is mad. I don't know what's happening here, everybody. I said, you know, there's just sometimes things that you've never seen, you've never read, and no one's ever told you about. All right, we're going to carry on looking for some more amazing... Relaxing, enjoying the view, as are we. And who knows what her next move will be. I'm guessing that she is going to get up fairly shortly. She does seem quite alert, not too sleepy. So hopefully she takes us on a stroll. The lapwings have kind of quietened down for now, even though you can hear one or two of them squawking in the background. you also notice lots of little black dots in the background. There's a whole bunch of wildebeest over there. Possibly a little bit too big for her, but female cheetahs are known to take down young wildebeest from time to time. It's not easy for them, but certainly achievable. Hello, Pugmaster. You'd like to know if female cheetah can run as fast as normal when they are pregnant. And, I mean, I would guess maybe up until the last week or two of their three-month gestation, they're probably going to be moving 
at the same speed they ordinarily would be able to. They might slow down ever, ever so slightly when they are fully pregnant. But I'm not sure if anybody actually would have been able to do decent tests on that. Now, what we must remember is that a lot of the predators give, <coughs> excuse me, give birth to uh, very underdeveloped youngsters, especially if you compare them to the herbivores or the prey animals. And the reason for that is that, obviously, a female impala would rather take the risk on herself to be a little bit heavier and then definitely run slower than she ordinarily would be able to and then that way be able to give birth to a better developed youngster that can run within 15 to 20 minutes of being born the same doesn't go for predators their young will be blind for the first 10 days to two weeks of their life so they've evolved differently the predators and the prey animals and i think we would be able to kind of fairly assume that cheats are not going to be, able, be, be, be they wouldn't actually be able to afford to lose too much speed because then it would be too difficult for them to catch their prey if this is the same female that was seen yesterday by one of the cheetah researchers not far from here her name is apparently nora and i don't know too much about her it's the first time i, I would have seen her i haven't spent time with many female cheetahs other than malaika and I did, do know that she did catch a scrub here yesterday morning. She just flushed it in some thick bush and a few pounces and she was on top of it. But that's just a little snack. And of course, she's, if it is her, she's got some growing babies in her belly. Now, I find it difficult to tell whether a cheetah are kind of hungry or well-fed. It's definitely more complicated than lions and cheetah, uh, sorry, leopard. But I do think that she is looking quite swollen. So hopefully she is pregnant. I would love to be able to spend some time with some cheetah cubs with you. That's one thing we haven't really been able to effectively do. Brent got you a few glimpses of some cheetah cubs a couple of weeks back, but that was that was the only one-off time I think we... Speaking of finding things, these elephants are doing their best to find the falling fruits from the Balanites trees. And these two have been racing one another from tree to tree to try and see who can gobble up the fruits first. They sadly aren't big enough to shake the trees like some bulls or possibly their mother. So, we haven't seen them doing that yet, sadly. It's one of my favourite things to watch, is elephants shaking trees to... Some of you may remember a very interesting sighting we had back on Juma, when the elephants were going from marula tree to marula tree, seeking out marula fruits, and I plonked my little camera down, right in front of the fruit that the elephant was heading towards, and he ended up picking up the camera and putting it in its mouth before tossing it out. <laughs> they small kind of oblong fruits, about an inch long. We'll try and show you some once this Ellie's moved off. It's just a few meters away from the vehicle. And I love it when they are in these moods going from tree to tree seeking out fruits because as long as you position the vehicle in that area before they actually get there, they tend to kind of act like we're not even here. And literally, I would say I'm three meters away from this youngster at the moment. We're very nice and close. But because we were here before they arrived, it allowed us a bit of, it allowed us to join their party. What I would like to do is just swivel the vehicle slightly there. I don't think it's her goal here. I think it's an itch she's trying to relieve. What they do is they'll just put their forehead against the tree usually when they try and shake it to get the fruits off and just give it a, not a head butt, but they just rock their body backwards and forwards and their head is what is against the tree front on. Isn't her ivory magnificent? Very big tusks for a lady. very very good hello young max just six years old you would like to know if it's true that elephants never forget well i think they may forget some things but they certainly do have good memories that can be said about them and having any of it and it was i think when lions were introduced into the area that had maybe never seen rhinos before and thought oh, hey this could make a great meal and they jumped on its back and all the rhino did was run through an acacia thicket the acacia carous out came the rhino, no lions. <laughs> lions do not have tough skin like rhinos do, especially on their sides, on their back, on their rump. It's quite thin and sensitive around the ears and also around the tail. But um, and even lion's claws wouldn't do too much damage uh, by gripping onto the back of a rhino. So it's not a favorite food of the lions. And I think that they'll leave them around, especially something like a black rhino that's known to have a short fuse. Uh, I wouldn't want to get on the other end of that sharp horn. I don't think they would stand for any nonsense at all. Isn't this great? Now, James, 
you know, we, we were talking about rain and animals being water dependent and, you know, hippos and things like that and them dehydrating. Your question is, well, similar. How water dependent are black rhino? Well, a lot of the vegetation that they're feeding on, remember, they're browsers, so they don't graze. Um, they get a lot of their moisture from, from plants, but they, they will drink. Um, I pretty much, at, when I was guiding down in the Eastern Cape, there was one really old black rhino male, and he used to go down and have a drink every afternoon at the same dam. It was just his favorite spot, and he would wallow in it too. Um, so I suppose, I think it depends on a lot of different things, um, how, how, how lush the vegetation is in the area. Um, if there's water available, of course, they, they will drink it. They, like the white runners, they love to have a little bit of wallow. So I think it just depends. And there's plenty of little pools of water for them to, to have a sip on. But it's not it's not particularly hot here. So I, well, I don't think so. Obviously, the animals climatized to uh, their environment. I mean, the, the rhinos down in South Africa will be slightly different to the black rhinos up here because, well, the habitat's different. The temperature's different. You know, there's lots of different things. All that movement you can hear behind me, there are lots and lots of vehicles about here. They are so excited to see the black rhino. I don't know how common of a sight it is to see. I think that we're very, very privileged. Now, I can't tell you if it's a male or female from, from here. I think that's the female, though, because like I said to you, the second one had a very, very tatty, tatty, tattered left ear, and I wonder if that's maybe not a bull from fighting. They often, often sort of uh, get raggy ears. Uh, we, I mean, we see that with lions as well and leopards too. And as they get older, it looks like it has a notch or something out of its ear, perhaps. Uh, they have been doing some research on them here. Uh, not necessarily tagging them with a tracking device, but possibly taking blood samples uh, and then notching, being able to identify them. Or it could just be natural too. That's so far away. I'm actually, why are you looking? I want to have a quick look with my binoculars. I just want to be able to, there's a bit of a glare on the screen. Maybe I'll be able to give you some more insight. See if I can see the other one. I haven't seen it pop out yet. Where did you go? <laughs> Now, no one likes me. I don't like your Twitter handle. You make me sad. <laughs> but I know that you're happy because you're watching the show, but you're wondering if there's any particular reason why the rhino has that big horn. Most certainly, it's very, very important, a uh, horn to a rhino. And really, rhinos only need their horns. I don't know why people constantly want to... Yeah? Oh, Cherie, you'd like to know if the animals ever get heat stroke. Um, look, I, I don't know if heat stroke is what would actually be the main concern for animals in very hot areas, but certainly I think it will have an effect on them. They may kind of dry out and dehydrate at a faster rate, but here in the Mara, it's not very hot. Throughout the year, the temperature is fairly constant because we are on the equator. You don't find huge differences in temperature between the seasons. And like I say, the Mara is typically quite cool. There are other wilderness areas throughout Africa where you do get very, very hot environments where some of the animals are adapted specifically to live in them and or have learnt the ways of the wild to be able to survive there. Anka, you would like to know what these white flowers are. And unfortunately, I do not have the faintest idea. But let me reverse a bit and try and get Manu an opportunity to film one. And maybe you guys can try and work it out. I don't have a flower book with me. But I'll go down onto this white one right here and see if you can get a good angle on it. That should work nicely. So this is what they look like up close. Very pretty. But I wouldn't even hazard a guess as to what it could be. Hello, Eric the Poets. And you've mentioned that these flowers have just bloomed since yesterday's rains. And I'm sure a lot of them possibly did just pop out today. But I did notice a few yesterday, so I'm guessing before the rain. So I'm guessing it's a recent bloom that's happened within the last week. It was about a week since I was last here. And it certainly does make for a wonderful scene. I was in South Africa a couple of weeks ago and was very fortunate to be able to head up to the West Coast National Park where there's an incredible wild, wild flower blooming every August and September and I was absolutely shocked at the amount of flowers in this place. It was ridiculous. So I'm quite happy to see some here as well. Not quite as many as the West Coast National Park but certainly creating a magic scene. Okay, I'm feeling a little bit nervous that the cheetahs may be getting up and getting ready to move, so I think we should start heading back there. And I also want to be waiting there in case the rain does start to fall. We'll be in position where we can just drop down all of our flaps and prepare for the onslaught. Wonderful stuff. Well, as we make our way back to the cheetah, you are going to be making your way back to the spotted cat with Tristan down in Juma. Well, we are still with our spotted cat, and hopefully Scott will have some luck with his cheetah and see more epic sightings of them, because, well, I think Scott has been spoiled more than anybody. He's had some amazing stuff. I've seen. It is associated with a violent sort of expulsion of the bowels. And 
I don't know if it's a it's an automatic response, just a fear response. You see a lot of animals sort of defecating when they're being attacked by something larger. There we go. Let's see how big this hippo opens up his mouth and see it exactly what's happening. It might be a female there trying to protect her young. Quite often, about 50% of all the hippos born in a year are attacked by older males and killed by older males. Uh, in these sort of, I suppose, displaced aggression would be a, a, a way to put it. There's this big guy now eliciting another reaction from... Um, Another one of them. They're all sort of facing this guy and doesn't look... There's a bit of tension in this, in this pool. I don't quite know how to read hip, hippo behavior. You know, half of their faces under the water all the time. It's difficult to see exactly what's going on. Casey, you want to know how hippos sleep? And it's a very good question, considering that they're mammals and they need to breathe air. Um, very similar to whales and... ...sleep with a portion of their brain still awake, the portion that controls their breathing. And they will automatically lift their heads above the water and take a breath but without them actually returning to full consciousness so a couple of minutes they take a breath and then their head goes back down again without them realizing what they're doing and that uh it is quite an amazing feat that especially from a land-based animal like we are now this has calmed down why don't we go to main south where i've managed to find what all the cars are gathering about let me be quite honest we found it there in the grass there's a lioness um and uh, a governor's camp safari vehicle in the background there is taking the tourists off on the rest of the game drive, leaving the picture remarkably free of vehicles in actual fact. Um, lions on the edge of these rivers do attract a lot of attention from, uh, from safari vehicles because, of course, animals are concentrated... Ah, there's another lioness there as well. Okay. I didn't know there were two there. You know what? I haven't seen a lion in real life for some, quite some time. I've been stuck in my office for a bit. Not that it's a bad office, I must be honest with you. I'll show you the view that I have from my office in a second. Let's just have a look at these two lioness. They're obviously hunting these crossings. This is what the Paradise Pride of lioness do. This is what they specialize in. They know that the wildebeest will come, that the wildebeest will go from being spread out over a wide front to being concentrated at these crossing points. And they've adapted their hunting strategy to hunt them as they enter or exit the water. And it's a very, very uh, successful hunting strategy because these lionesses number quite a few. The pride itself is big. As far as I know, it's the largest pride of lions in the market. To judge exactly which is that is but I'm, I'm almost convinced that these lion prides that live on the river are some of the largest the paradise pride obviously they don't their territory won't extend the entire um the entire mara uh, mara river it'll just be in this particular point there's another lioness okay so three lioness no wonder we haven't seen too much action today in terms of cat mama you'd like to know are there any kind of specific differences that cheetah have to the other big cats and one of the main ones is that their their leg their bones and their legs are fused together in a different way so they don't have as much movement as a lion and a leopard's leg so climbing trees for them is more tricky but what it does mean is that when they are at full tilt those bones allow for them to obviously move more effectively at high speed so that's one thing their tails are quite long and quite big and bushy and needed for balance so at the high speeds that they travel at, so I think their tails are kind of more important, you could almost say, than that of a lion or a leopard. A lion or a leopard without a tail, I don't think is going to have a huge issue catching its prey, but I think a cheetah would battle quite a lot without that form of steering. So there's a couple of differences. Very, very wonderful. Hello to Enchanted Music. You would like to know if I've got any idea how many cheetah are in this area. Well, in the entire Masai Mara Reserve, Triangle, and the surrounding conservancy, so it's built up in three parts, there are a total of, I'm told, around 65 cheetahs, or at least that was the count last year. So, good cheetah numbers. That's probably in around an area of around 200,000 hectares. Possibly a little bit bigger than that, including the conservancies. We've got access to 170,000 hectares of the Masai Mara, which, is include, well, which includes the Triangle and the Reserve. So plenty of cheetah, and I know on this side of the Mara River, in the Mara Reserve, there does seem to be more cheetah than on the other side of the river where Jamie is this afternoon and where our camp is on the Triangle side. Quite often, I've been out here and heard many reports of various cheetahs, although we have kind of tended to focus on the Musketeer Coalition. So don't be fooled, simply because we're only showing you those males for the majority of the time, it doesn't mean there's not a lot more cheetah moving around. And as the weeks and months go by, hopefully we'll be able to get to know them all a little bit better and spend more time with them. They are absolutely great quality and often do a lot of their business during the day, which suits us. It's definitely easier to film and show you guys things during the day compared to the night time. Very good, especially when knowing where to travel, where to get water, where to get food. 
because they live for quite a long time, Max, they can live for about 60 years, which is longer than most animals can live out here. Their memory helps them to build up experience over those years to know where to go, what to do, what's dangerous, what's not. So they certainly are very, very intelligent animals. But I'm not entirely certain that they can remember everything. That would be really incredible. Maybe they can. But I guess just like us, Max, you probably don't remember, you know, your first few years on the planet when we were very young. And I'm guessing elephants might be in the same boat. Hi, Justin. You'd like to know how heavy would her tusks be? And I've never... I mean, it's usually the hunting professions that kind of would have a better idea of tusk weights because it's of interest to them. But, I'm, you know, a hundred pounder would be considered a very big elephant, a tusker with hundred pound tusks. And I guess that refers to just the one tusk, not both of them. Um, so, although no, 50 kgs, would that be too heavy for a tusk? I'm actually not sure, Justin. I don't have the faintest idea how heavy they would be. Of course, their thickness has an impact on that. She's got fairly thick tusks for a female, but a bull of her size would ordinarily have far thicker tusks. But I am no expert in terms of gauging the weight of one. I've never been around a weighing of a tusk, so I've got nothing really to go off. Beautiful. We're going to let the elephants continue strolling off and send you back to Taylor. Mara River going over some of the rapids. So this is why we can hear it so loudly as it pounds over the beautiful rocks. Not flowing quite as fast as it was.